Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. Would ask everyone here in house if you'll check that cell phones have been turned off as we prepare to begin. Uh, the courtesy is always appreciated. We will, of course, post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference, and our internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments at any time simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. Hosting today's program is Cully Stimson. Mr. Stimson serves as manager of our National Security Law Program and is also a senior legal fellow in the Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Institute for International Studies. He is a nationally recognized expert in national security, homeland security, and crime control. He writes and lectures widely on policy issues such as military uh, detention and commissions, intelligence and criminal law, including the Patriot Act and FISA, immigration, and the war on drugs. Before joining us in 2007, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Detainee Affairs. He has also worked as a prosecutor at the local, state, and federal levels, including military settings and as a defense attorney. And he served three tours on active duty in the Navy Judge Advocate General's Corps. Please join me in welcoming Cully Stimson. Cully? Thank you very much, John, uh, and thank, uh, thanks to all of you for braving this uh, first of many miserable days in Washington when the fall uh, starts raining and then it starts snowing later on. Um, I'm particularly pleased to have uh, these three panelists here because, all modesty aside, I think they are probably, uh, if not the most qualified, certainly in the, in the fraternity of the most qualified uh, people to talk about this subject uh, today. <clears throat> Since the ratification of the United States Constitution, the Congress has declared war only five times. The War of 1812, uh, wherein Congress declared war even before hostilities began, the Mexican-American War of 1846, the Spanish-American War of 1898, and then uh, the Great War, World War I and World War II. And those declarations of war were accompanied, uh, as we state in Heritage's new uh, second uh, Heritage Guide to the Constitution by express authorizations of the use of force, suggesting a distinction in practice at least between those two. Congress has expressly authorized presidents to use military force dozens of times in our history. Many of those authorizations have been directed at non-state actors such as slave traders, pirates, and Indian tribes. A week after the 9-11 attacks in 2001, Congress passed the Authorization for Use of Military Force, or AUMF, which was directed at, quote, those nations, organizations, or persons the president determines planned, authorized, committed, or aided the 9-11 attacks, or aided those terrorist attacks, or harbored such organizations or persons in order to prevent any future attacks of international terrorism against the United States by such nations, organizations, or persons. Last year, the Obama administration announced they would like to see the 2001 AUMF scaled back and ultimately repealed. I warned in my May 2013 testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee that repealing the AUMF prematurely would be unwise and that it should remain in place, quote, unless and until the narrow class of persons under its scope no longer poses a substantial threat to our national security, unquote. This year, in announcing military action against ISIS, the Obama administration announced that they were relying on the 2001 AUMF because, in so many words, ISIS is al-Qaeda. Which brings us to today's discussion. As a legal matter, is the Obama administration on solid ground relying on the 2001 AUMF as a matter of domestic law in this war against ISIS. We know that the American people and apparently Congress support military action against ISIS and perhaps even successor or affiliated organizations like Khorasan. But what role should Congress play, especially since Article I, Section 8, Clause 2, the Declare War Clause, gives Congress the power to declare war? And how does that conflict with Article II, Section 2, the President's powers as Commander-in-Chief? Essentially, the question is this. Do we need an ISIS-specific AUMF? 
why or why not? Our three panelists are uniquely qualified to answer that and related questions. And I've asked them to speak not only in alphabetical order, but in the order I think that will ultimately stimulate the, the greatest debate and crosstalk. Steve Bradbury is a litigation partner at Deckard LLP. During the Bush administration, Steve was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice, where he served from 2004 until 2009. While at OLC, Mr. Bradbury advised on a wide range of national security matters, including questions relating to the president's statutory and constitutional powers in time of armed conflict, the scope and application of the AUMF and other statutes, both authorizing and limiting executive action, cybersecurity issues, and authorities of the National Security Agency and the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Mr. Bradbury served as a law clerk to the Honorable Justice Clarence Thomas on the United States Supreme Court and to Judge James Buckley on the D.C. Circuit. He is a graduate of the Michigan Law School and Stanford University. Bobby Chesney is the Charles I. Francis Professor in Law at the University of Texas at Austin, where he also serves as Director of the University's Interdisciplinary Center focused on international security issues. He is one of the co-founders of the blog Lawfare, and he has written there and in law reviews about the fit or misfit between our legal architecture and our actual counterterrorism activities. Bobby served on the Obama uh, administration's deten detention policy task force in 2009, which was tasked by the president in conducting a comprehensive review of long-term policy options relating to lethal force, detention, and other outcomes in combat and counterterrorism settings. A graduate of Texas Christian University and the Harvard Law School, Bobby is busy these days writing a book under contract with Oxford that places the post-9-11 de debates in a long-term historical context. Steve Laddick is a professor of law at the American University, Washington College of Law, and a nationally recognized expert on the role of the federal courts in the war on terrorism. Steve is a co-editor of Aspen Publishing's leading national security law and counterterrorism law casebook, a senior editor of the peer-reviewed Journal of National Security Law and Policy, co-editor-in-chief of the Just Security blog, and a contributing editor to Lawfare. Steve is also the Supreme Court Fellow at the Constitution Project and a Fellow at the Center on National Security at Fordham University Law School and is the Vice President of the Board of Directors of the ACLU here in the nation's capital. A graduate of Amherst College and Yale Law School, Steve clerked for the Honorable Marsha Bar Berzon on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit and the Honorable Rosemary Barquette on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Eleventh Circuit. Steve, you can stay there or take the podium. It's your pleasure. I think I'll uh, just stay right here if everyone can hear me. Thanks a lot, Cully. Uh, I want to thank you for arranging this and thank the Heritage Foundation for hosting this uh, discussion on, a, I think, an important and timely topic. Um, there are really two distinct legal questions uh, when you talk about the use of force by the United States or any country. One is whether it's consistent with international law. Uh, that's a, not a subject we're going to spend a lot of time on today, and it's not a very difficult question, I think, in this particular instance. Under international law, nations can use armed force in the territory of another nation in self-defense or with the authorization of the UN Security Council, and I think there's a strong case here for self-defense. A lot of countries in the Gulf area in the Middle East are directly threatened by the uh, rise of ISIS and its takeover of territory, including a third of uh, Iraq. The United States is threatened. U.S. Uh, citizens have been murdered by ISIS. They're threatening attacks. They've carried out uh, at least one terrorist attack, as I understand it, in Europe, uh, threatening other attacks and clearly threatening allies of the United States and the strategic interests of the U.S. and the Middle East. So it's a strong case for self-defense, and the president has also put it in terms of collective self-defense. There are a lot of different countries, I think, that can claim uh, a direct interest in self-defense and taking military action against ISIS. That's under international law principles. The trickier question, and the question for today is really domestic U.S. law. Is the president authorized under U.S. law to take this military action against 
uh, ISIS. And as Cully uh, described in his intro, the issue really is one of constitutional powers as between Congress and the president. Obviously, under Article I of the Constitution, Congress has the power to declare war for the United States, take the country into war as a formal matter. And Congress has the power to provide for the Army and Navy, which means the power of the purse to fund, appropriate funds for the Army and the Navy, our, mil our armed services, and to fund major military uh, operations campaigns. So as you've seen, for example, uh, President Obama uh, did need to go to Congress to get appropriations and authorization for the transfer of military materiel and for the training facilities that they're going to set up, uh, evidently, in Saudi Arabia to train uh, moderate Syrian forces that we want to <laughs> see fighting uh, ISIS in Syria. So that's an example of Congress approving uh, military appropriation in conjunction with uh, with a military uh, operation. But the question is, what is the president's authority under domestic US law to engage in a major military action like this uh, in foreign territories against a foreign threat um, without a declaration of war from Congress? And you know that has happened many times in the history of the country. Uh, as Cully indicated, there have been only five occasions when Congress has actually passed a declaration of war. And in many, many other occasions, some very significant, ongoing, uh, warlike uh, um, armed conflicts, the president of the United States has engaged in uh, the use of military force without a formal declaration of war. And uh, it goes all the way back to the Jefferson administration when he uh, used the Marines to attack the Barbary pirates. Uh, off the uh, coast of North Africa that were, were attacking, shipping, and putting in threat U.S. commerce and, and uh, European commerce, et cetera. And there have been many other occasions when presidents have used force in foreign countries, uh, sometimes in very large scale, to protect U.S. citizens, U.S. interests, to respond to direct threats to U.S. national security interests um, and the interests of allies and sometimes at the request of, uh, of other uh, nations. And often, as we've seen, uh, has become a, uh, really uh, the more usual practice, uh, actually, in recent years. Congress does usually enact some legislation uh, showing congressional support for the actions of the president and the executive branch. Now, they may be authorizations in the form of uh, 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 limited authorizations or, author or appropriations of funding, as we saw with the Kosovo uh, action, which was a NATO action. Or they may be a more formal and specific authorization for the use of military force, usually focused on a particular uh, threat. There was the authorization for use of military force in 2002 associated with the uh, campaign to liberate Iraq and the, uh, the war against Saddam Hussein's regime in uh, Iraq. But then there is the rather unusual, because 9-11 itself was very unusual, AUMF, for Authorization for the Use of Military Force, in September of 2001, responding to what was and continues to be historically the largest foreign attack on the U.S. homeland in the history of the country, the 9-11 attacks. And in response to that, Congress gave the President a very broad authorization which was not specific to any particular territory, was not limited in time. And it gave the president authority to use all, necess all necessary military force against those organizations responsible for 9-11, any countries that harbored them or supported them, in order to prevent future terrorist attacks against US and US interests. And the major primary focus of that uh, authorization is, of course, Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda organization, which is the organization uh, historically led by Osama bin Laden that was responsible for plotting and carrying out the attacks on 9-11. Uh, Al-Qaeda is not uh, some formal corporate organization with uh, corporate charter and board of directors and a legal uh, existence, and you could say it's clearly defined as a particular organization. It is a loose 
organization or network of associated terrorist operations cells. It is a movement with a long-term strategic goal to force out of the Middle East Western powers, particularly the US and the influence of Western powers, and also eventually to topple those governments in the Middle East that are friendly to the US and the West, and eventually to set up a caliphate uh, subject to strict Sharia law. And I think the vision of Osama bin Laden and uh, the <clears throat> Al-Qaeda movement was to set up such a caliphate from the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean, basically. And uh, as a strategic part of that goal, as the tactics of the organization, to carry out terrorist attacks, to frighten uh, the people of the West, the governments, the United States and other governments, and as a, as a, a, a byproduct of terrorism, to get them to retreat from and pull back from uh, their position of influence in the Middle East and with the governments uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Al-Qaeda, the word, means base or foundation. And as that implies, I think, <clears throat> the vision on which it's founded is a vision of uh, uh, an organization that would itself be the trunk of a tree that would grow. It would be a base from which would spring like-minded movements and groups to carry out and further this long-range strategic goal of the uh, Al-Qaeda organization. So uh, as I think what you can see, what I'm leading up to is I think there's a very strong argument that the president is correct that the 2001 authorization for the use of military force focused on Al-Qaeda does continue to give the president uh, authority statutory authority approved by Congress to carry out this, this continuing war on terror, including against ISIS, both in Iraq and in Syria, and indeed anywhere where they are found. Um, essentially, I believe ISIS is Al-Qaeda. The president has authority under the AMF to determine that ISIS is a continuation an offshoot, a new, uh, a reconstituted and new version, if you will, of the Al-Qaeda organization. Uh, and I think you can see that clearly from the historical uh, roots of <laughs> ISIS, the Islamic State. Its former name was Al-Qaeda in Iraq. This is the successor organization to Musab al-Zarqawi's organization in Iraq, Al-Qaeda in Iraq, or AQI which began as the Al-Qaeda affiliate, as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, as the name uh, implies. And uh, it uh, attracted a lot of uh, Iraqi fighters and others from around the world. Uh, they put something of an Iraqi face on uh, Al-Qaeda, and they did attack coalition forces uh, in Iraq and elsewhere, and they were particularly brutal and active as a fighting force. And it is true that uh, at a certain point, bin Laden chastised Zarqawi for being a, a too zealous, uh, perhaps, in attacking other Sunni Muslims uh, in Iraq and criticized his tactics and sort of disassociated uh, Zarqawi's operation to some degree from uh, the wishes of the so-called uh, leadership of al-Qaeda in, uh, in Pakistan and the border regions of Afghanistan and Pakistan. But nevertheless, this was the spawn of al-Qaeda. This was very much an al-Qaeda organization. And the United States uh, targeted and killed Zarqawi in 2006. And I believe, in substantial part, the United States did that under the authorization for use of military force of 2001. Now, the US also was in Iraq <coughs> under the 2002 AUMF. That was primarily directed at the Saddam Hussein uh, Ba'athist regime of Iraq, uh, but it's obviously the case that uh, Iraq became very much a battlefield in the war on terror and that the U.S. was operating under the 2001 AUMF in carrying out operations, counterterrorism operations, including military operations like the 
targeting of Zarqawi uh, in Iraq. Uh, al Bagradi, the current head of uh, ISIS, is a successor to Zarqawi. Uh, there were a couple of other uh, Iraqis who headed up the organization in between who have also been targeted and killed, uh, but al Bagradi is now uh, heading it up. Um, it's expanded, obviously, opportunistically into Syria because of the lack of government control of areas of Syria and the breakdown in the governing structure of uh, the Assad regime in Syria and all the civil war and conflict. Uh, and it has mobilized very successfully attracting fighters that it's paying. It has funding sources through the control of uh, oil uh, assets. And it's setting, it's basically taking territory and setting up essentially that caliphate that I think bin Laden uh, envisioned. And uh, an argument that this is not al-Qaeda stems primarily from the fact that the current, what you might call the old line leaders of the old or original al-Qaeda in Pakistan, like uh, Zawahiri, have again disassociated themselves from uh, the actions of ISIS and uh, al Baghradi, I think because they're in part jealous of the success and attention, it's pretty obvious that ISIS is a more virulent, more potent, and if you will, more successful version of Al Qaeda because they're moving very quickly to seize territory, attract fighters, organize a bigger army, and begin to carry out that long term vision. And it's pretty obvious they. They threaten Israel. They threaten Saudi Arabia. They want to keep uh, expanding. Uh, it is the ultimate vision of bin Laden and Zawahiri. But Zawahiri is feeling, I think, a little inferior. He's in a diminished <clears throat> capacity in a weaker place right now. He wants to try to maintain his relevance. And so he's trying to set up uh, a separate image of uh, al Qaeda, separate and distinct from ISIS. Um, ISIS, in turn, is uh, in a, an ascendant position, obviously, a leadership role, attracting a lot of the fighters who would otherwise go to the old line uh, al-Qaeda uh, groups. Um, and it's rebranded itself, as lots of successful movements uh, uh, do. But I think it's, it, it should be clear that the president's authority to carry out the authorization uh, granted by Congress and to target those organizations uh, uh, responsible for 9-11 in what is pretty obviously now a continuing war on terror. It's not over. We haven't defeated uh, the enemy in the war on terror. But that the president does have authority to treat ISIS as a continuation of al-Qaeda, the new face of al-Qaeda, and that uh, the president's authority is not diminished simply because of the branding or self-imaging decisions made by the leadership of ISIS or the, uh, if you will, uh, feeling, of threat, th feeling of being threatened by the success of ISIS uh, on the part of Zawahiri and the old line leadership. Okay. In other words, those internal <clears throat> dynamics and decisions don't trump the president's authority to uh, see ISIS for what it is, which is the new face and continuation of al-Qaeda. And it's pretty obvious that ISIS in its control of territory in Syria is creating a safe haven for the very same types of training and plotting by al-Qaeda and al-Qaeda entities that occurred in Afghanistan prior to 9-11. So we also targeted in these recent strikes this Khorasan group headed by a guy named al-Fadli. And uh, al-Fadli had been uh, an al-Qaeda uh, fighter who was in Iran uh, leading al-Qaeda supply and support efforts through Iran, and he was supplying and supporting Zarqawi and al-Qaeda in Iraq. That was uh, sort of his historical uh, origins. He's now clearly was operating, if he's still alive, he's still operating, uh, to plan attacks on the West within the safe haven uh, created by ISIS. Uh, and so obviously the threat to the West is very much the same as it was uh, from the Taliban and al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, and I think it's, a very, it's very much a continuation of the same threat and, in effect, the same organizations. We've treated al-Shabaab -Sha al in Somalia. We've treated al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and Yemen 
as parts of al-Qaeda, offshoots of al-Qaeda. And in many ways, ISIS is more closely uh, related historically to uh, al-Qaeda than those organizations. And so clearly it's all part of the same uh, war on terror, which is not limited by specific borders, and which was authorized uh, in 2001 by Congress in the AUMF. It's a separate question whether the president should, whether it would be a good thing as a policy matter for the president to go to Congress and get a specific new AUMF for the current threat uh, profile and landscape that we face. I think there's a strong argument that that should happen. I think it would be a good thing for the country, for Congress to have a full debate and discussion and to uh, perhaps put the president and the country on firmer, clearer statutory grounds going forward in terms of a new authorization for the use of military force that is tailored to the landscape as we see it today. But the question of whether the president must do that, whether the president lacks authority to take this action in the absence of such a new AUMF, I think is, to me, it's a pretty clear, pretty strong case the president has the authority, does not as a legal matter have to seek a new AUMF. Thanks. Thanks, Steve. Bobby, uh, join the conversation. Um, set aside for the moment, because I think we all agree that as a political matter, it probably would be worthwhile. And we probably will see a robust debate after the midterms uh, on the Hill. Um, uh, what's Steve have wrong? Where, what's he missing? Um, or does he have it right? I don't think it's as easy as, as Steve suggested. Uh, I want to begin by saying that as a policy matter, not focused on the policy question of going to Congress, but the policy question of whether we need to be doing something with our military force to, to address the threat posed by ISIS, the answer is clearly yes in my view. So I, I don't want people to read policy assumptions into what I'm about to say in the legal analysis. So I think, I think this is a, a tale of two different targets, and by distinguishing the uh, relationship of U.S. domestic law to those two different targets, we, we see why this is actually quite a difficult question as to one of them. Uh, for one of these targets, and I, I really just wanted to use the alliteration, that's why I said targets, I'm really talking about a tale of two different groups. One of the groups I want to talk about is, is uh, what was referred to a moment ago as the Khorasan group. Um, Al-Fadli, who Steve mentioned, uh, is a longtime senior al-Qaeda agent. Um, and last year, the senior leadership of al-Qaeda, which is now run by Ayman al-Zawahiri, out of some place, presumably in Pakistan, uh, dispatched <laughs> al-Fadli, who had come to Pakistan from Iran, where he'd been for many years, uh, dispatched him to Syria to work with the al-Qaeda cell that was already there. And I, I don't mean the al-Nusra front. Al-Nusra is the al-Qaeda loyal uh, fighting force uh, that is that has been in Syria for a long time. I'm talking instead about a kind of a classic al-Qaeda cell. These are people there. Um, under some degree of direction and control from the, the old senior leadership, Zawahiri himself. And Al-Fadli was dispatched to, to take uh, control of that group and to take advantage of the incredible opportunities that Syria seemed to provide. What were those opportunities? You have this influx of Western <coughs> fighters, passport-holding Americans and Europeans, being radicalized, uh, many of them working with Al-Nusra Front. The Al-Qaeda cell was at least in part working to try to make contact and bring those people into the fold of external operations. So this cell, this thing that begins to become known as the Khorasan Group, uh, it's simply an al-Qaeda cell, and it's very much focused on external operations against Western and American targets. And we're told that they were working with AQAP, uh, that's the Yemen franchise, uh, which has a real knack and, and a real track record of trying to produce uh, explosives that would be hard to detect in airport security. This is the story surrounding this particular cell. Um, and why do that in Syria? Because you're, you're able to operate with a little more freedom of action. That's, that's the real harm in, in the safe havens that groups like al-Nusra begin to carve out and ISIS begins to carve out in places like Syria. So the Khorasan group, we, we launched um, some 40-plus Tomahawk missiles at it the other day at eight separate targets. Um, there's a debate raging now, did we get al-Fadli or not? And, of course, we need to not think that it's – just him that matters. It's the whole cell that matters. Um, it's an easy case, legally. This is a core case. It's, it's double covered. It's covered both by the 2001 AUMF, and it's not a hard call. And I'll argue in a second it's covered by Article 2 as well, even if there was no AUMF. It's covered by the 2001 AUMF because this is a straight-up situation of attacking al-Qaeda itself. As Steve mentioned, al-Qaeda doesn't have the traditional trappings of a hierarchical organization. 
but it does have some degree of organization. That's how you can distinguish al-Qaeda from the broad Salafist jihadi movement of which al-Qaeda for, more, for many, many years has aspired to be the vanguard, but, it, but is not coextensive and has, has rivals, now including ISIS, for that leadership. Um, this isn't a case of a local group that declared its affiliation with al-Qaeda the way that, for example, the Algerian group that once was known as the Salafist group for preaching and combat later changed its name to al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. This is a group centrally controlled and dispatched and answering to the central leadership. Easy case under the 2001 AMF, much more so even than other classic cases of affiliated al-Qaeda organizations. And for those who aren't steeped in this issue, it's important that you understand there's a, we have more than a decade of wrestling with what are the bounds of the AUMF. What's given the decentralized nature of al-Qaeda, <clears throat> which organizations, and for that matter, individuals, come within its scope. The position of the executive branch, both under the Bush administration and the Obama administration, blessed repeatedly by the federal courts, and uh, also in, in various ways written into statute now, all endorse a model in which you have whatever counts as core al-Qaeda, and then you have franchise operations that have sufficient connection, and there's the rub, what's the sufficient connection, but sufficient connection to the core to be part of the network, and these are generally referred to as associated forces. Now, there are many associated forces out there, um, Al-Shabaab, Al-Nusra, AQIM, um, the, the list, we can proliferate the names. They're not all identically situated vis-a-vis -vis the senior leadership. Some of them emerge relatively uh, centrally directed. Some of them were entirely independent groups that later on de <coughs> declare allegiance and change their name. Um, one thing that's been clear, at least in recent years, is the administration seems to take the position that the AMF doesn't apply to any group that just comes along and says we're adopting the al-Qaeda label. It applies to those groups that have that kind of connection, that there is the nexus with al-Qaeda, and they're engaged in hostilities against the United States. And that's also to be determined what exactly <laughs> that means. But there is this dual test that's been, been how this has been understood for a number of years. Um, Khorasan, the Khorasan group isn't hard, and we shouldn't even call it the Khorasan group. That was a term of convenience that, from the intelligence community's perspective, helped describe which al-Qaeda cell they were talking about. We should just call it al-Qaeda, and that's what it is. Now, if there were no AUMF, um, if we can take uh, as a given that the facts that have been alleged about what this cell al-Qaeda was up to, um, you have du du duplicate or double grounds to invoke the president's authority to use military force in national self-defense. Um, as an initial matter, if they are al-Qaeda, then it continues to be the same situation of national self-defense that's obtained at least since 9-11 and arguably since uh, 2000 uh, or 1998, uh, depends on where you think the conflict began, but at least since 9-11. Uh, but more to the point, even if one wants to isolate this cell and hive it off, I, I would say artificially, from al-Qaeda writ large and examine whether there was a national self-defense scenario vis-a-vis -vis it, the administration's <laughs> position, as declared many times over, is that where there is an imminent threat to American lives, it will take action under Article II if necessary, including this sort of action. And imminence is not defined to mean strict temporal imminence, but imminence is defined to mean that there is a genuine threat to American lives and that you have a fleeting opportunity to act now, and you're not going to reliably know when the actual moment of the attack will come. And this is exactly the story that's been, been shared with reporters and, and reported quite a bit in recent days. Th there have been some other elements to the story, but let's just take that as a given. If that's true, you wouldn't even need the AUMF. So it's a useful and timely example of a clean case from a domestic law perspective. I'm sure we can quibble some on the margins about it, but relatively speaking, it's a pretty easy case. Um, and that brings us to ISIS, or ISIL, or whatever we want to call it, the, the entity formerly known as al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, it's not as easy a case. That's my fundamental point. Um, my initial reaction, when I first pondered, does the 2001 AMF apply to this, my initial reaction was, of course not. It can't. And the reason I thought that was, without having really reflected on it in a while, was that al-Qaeda and ISIS have broken up. Uh, if you don't follow the story, the relevant context is that ISIS, as it began operating across the border out of Iraq into S Syria, 
was in competition with the al-Nusra front. Al-Nusra there for a while was getting all the attention, seemed the most successful of the anti-Assad forces, it was drawing in recruits, and al-Baghdadi, the, the head of ISIS, um, asserted at one point that he is in fact the one who created al-Nusra, and it answers to him ultimately, and in fact he was calling for the groups to now be formally merged. He issued a press release, and he explained that, look, we, we kept our role on the down low initially because we didn't want Western intelligence agencies thinking of al-Nusra as al-Qaeda. But the jig is up, and I'm proud of my creation, and I am in command of it. Uh, the head of the al-Nusra front responded with his own press release immediately saying, uh, I thank you for the, the venture cap you provided us and the, the nice launch you gave us, but I don't answer to you. I answer to central al-Qaeda. I'm an al-Zawahiri, and he salutes. Um, they had a back and forth, and Zawahiri intervened and ruled in favor of the al-Nusra front, at which point the ISIL folks, uh, Baghdadi, told them to get lost. We don't answer to you at all, and they went on their path of formal independence. Zawahiri formally expels ISIS. Um, Al-Nusra al and ISIS uh, personnel have engaged in com combat in Syria. AQI was absolutely a, a paradigm example of an al-Qaeda cell that emerged into a standalone associated force engaged in hostilities against the United States. At that point in time, absolutely agree with Stephen. <coughs> AUMF covered it, both the 2001 and the 2002 AUMF, and Article 2 for that matter. There was never any tricky legal uh, questions when we were in Iraq and we were fighting AQI. It's just that you have two intervening factors and they muddy the waters. I'm not going to claim, because I've reflected on this a lot since the administration really hung its hat on this, this argument, I don't think it's as implausible an argument as I initially thought. But the two intervening factors, one, the formal break between ISIS and Al-Qaeda. And make no mistake, they are competing organizations. They are in the same game, vying for leadership of the broad Salafist jihadi movement that has long been Al-Qaeda's aspiration to lead, and now is ISIS's aspiration to lead, and ISIS seems to be doing a better job of it, um, judging by the recruiting and attention and so forth. That change must matter to some degree. Maybe it's not dispositive. Maybe the prior status is sticky. Maybe there are other arguments, and I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, but then there's also the fact that up till now, it seems to have been widely understood that the AUMF's reach into okay, it's not core al-Qaeda, but it's al-Qaeda-related organizations, did require this further factor of engagement and hostilities against the United States. Uh, at least prior to the beheadings, if you were going to make that argument, the beheadings of the American journalist, if you're going to make that argument, it had to rest either on an anticipatory case, although we've, we've heard from the director of the NCTC and others that that case actually hasn't been made yet, or hadn't been made yet, or it had to be, again, the stickiness of al-Qaeda in Iraq's prior engagement in hostilities, which certainly occurred in spades in Iraq. Um, the problem, of course, is we've been out of Iraq for a long time. It's been a number of years since we've been engaged in combat with AQI, or whatever it is now called. And, and as I thought about it, I, I, I appreciate how, just how indeterminate this factor is. So imagine it's the day we leave Iraq. And then something happens, there's an Al-Qaeda in Iraq target of opportunity, and we have a drone strike, and we take out the leader of Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Would anyone really say, well, you know, yesterday you were here and that would have been good, but now you're no longer engaged in hostilities because it's the day after America left Iraq. That sounds artificial and ridiculous and formalistic. On the other hand, if 25 years had gone by, and then we went back and it was the same group, and we said, well, 25 years ago we engaged in hostilities, that too would sound ridiculous and formalistic and not very persuasive. And there's a spectrum in between. And the interesting question is, if I'm right that this is a relevant consideration, what does it mean to be a couple of years removed from Iraq and then going back and, and treating this organization as engaged in hostilities against the United States? Um, you might buy it, you might not, and I think that's what makes it muddy but not really determinate either way. Now, there is the matter of the killing of the American journalist. Does that suffice to restore the easier situation where we clearly did have a group engaged in hostilities against us? I. I mean, it's tempting to think so. Certainly when you feel the rage, I think we all felt, and, and the horror and disgust of that barbarity, it's tempting to say, hell yes. Um, I'm not sure if it's quite that easy as we think about the range of situations around the world where groups might kill an American, um, situations in Mexico, for example. And we have to ponder what kind of, what kind of standard in the abstract you're setting, if that's going to become a touchstone of it. But, but it, it does muddy the water and make the case more sympathetic as I dwelt on it more. Well, anyways, um, we, we could go on at length. Uh, there is, a, I guess, a, a further question I hadn't thought about before, but, but Steve raised it in his remarks, and that is the possibility that interesting questions by me, and it's not 
up to anyone but the president to resolve them, that the right reading of the 2001 AUMF, which declares that the president is authorized to use all necessary and appropriate force against those whom he determines is responsible for the 9-11 attacks or harbored such entities, maybe that carries with it an interpretive power that allows him to define the scope of the enemy. Um, I'm not sure that's the best read of the statute, to be honest. It certainly empowers the president to decide who was responsible for the 9-11 attacks, and it certainly empowers the president to decide who is harboring that entity. The further question of exactly which affiliated organizations or formerly affiliated or successor organizations also count sufficiently as al-Qaeda strikes me as, as different in kind. Um, there's been a huge amount of litigation, thanks to the Guantanamo mess, um, pressing on the edges of what's the bound, organizational boundary of the AUMF. Um, and in nowhere in that litigation context has there ever been a hint that it was simply a question of, well, did the executive branch decide that <laughs> the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan counts? If so, it counts, and that's just the end of the story. Now, we're not in a courtroom, so that's not dispositive, but I mention it simply to underscore that the way a lot of us have been thinking about it over the past 12 years hasn't assumed that the president gets dispositive judgment as to which entities count or not. I'm certainly not saying the president's opinion doesn't matter. In fact, I would argue it deserves substantial deference in, in the, whether it's a court of law or the court of public opinion. Um, I don't think it's binding deference. I don't think the statute mandates that conclusion. Um, what about Article 2 as a fallback? Article 2, of course, if, if the AMF doesn't apply, why not Article 2? This is what's so interesting, because we were bombing the snot out of IS, IS for a couple of weeks, uh, more than 140 airstrikes, and there were multiple letters to Congress under the War Powers Resolution explaining the, the administration's legal justification, and I think it's quite telling that none of them invoked the 2001 AUMF. They all invoked difficult, article to, difficult to sustain, though not unsustainable, Article II arguments instead. That is powerful evidence to me that at least some folks in the administration weren't so sure that this is a clear case of the 2001 AMF applying, or else why not have invoked it? What were those arguments instead? It wasn't national self-defense. It wasn't that IS, IS is Al-Qaeda, and the same theories that enable us to act in <coughs> national self-defense against Al-Qaeda apply against these guys. It, it was two different arguments. One was immediate force protection of U.S. troops, a very legitimate Article II theory a little dicey in its factual application in some respects because it was used in two settings. One was uh, to justify strikes on ISIS forces as they approached Erbil, where U.S. troops were. Uh, and I actually think that was a perfectly fine invocation of that Article II authority. That makes a lot of sense. Could use that as an illustration. Um, the, the invocation of it to explain the attack on ISIS forces at the Mosul Dam, which was justified on the grounds that if the dam were to be breached, the downstream flooding would eventually reach Baghdad and then eventually could get into the green zone or wherever U.S. personnel were, <laughs> causing harm there, I think was a bit of a stretch. Um, the other argument the administration advanced was factually quite relevant to what they were doing, but this one was more dicey legally. And that was the idea that the president may have an inherent and independent authority to use force in circumstances of humanitarian, exigent self-defense of non-Americans. This is Mount Sinjar and, and, the, and the persons that were trapped there. It was an exigent humanitarian third-party defense situation. I'm just not so sure that we have a strong track record of, of acting in that way on sole presidential authority, although one might say, well, what was Korea and Kosovo? Well, I'll tell you what they are. They're, they're very controversial examples that people struggle with. What is the legacy of those? Does that prove the point? Or is that a bug or a feature of the argument? I don't know. Um, so, so let me stop there, having, having uh, said all that, to express why I struggle with and have trouble endorsing that 2001 AUMF argument. My bottom line is it's in the realm of plausible legal argument. I think I literally blogged at Lawfare, this is not plausible. Mm -hmm. I will revise that and say, when you really come to face to face with the indeterminacy of the organizational scope of the AUMF, and you combine it, not with the indeterminacy of, of Al Qaeda at large, but just this particular fact pattern, the legacy connection to AQI makes it just plausible enough to where I think it's, 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 a, it's a fair argument to make. I'm not buying it, but I think it's a fair argument to make. It certainly won't serve the political underlying foundational justification for why you want an AUMF to begin with. Why not just claim Article II authorities a la Truman and go forth and have something on the scale of the Korean War? And the answer is because there's all the benefits come from having clear buy-in from Congress. Invoking the 2001 AMF, because it's so muddy, whether that's really a good argument in my view, isn't going to get the administration any of the benefits that explain why you really need to go do this to begin with. 
And I think they understand that. And I think, frankly, I, I wonder, you know, if anyone in a, in a position to know the inside debates ever will watch this or is watching this and thinking, yeah, we know that. we got to get past the November elections, and then we're going to get it all fixed. We'll see. A point we uh, talked about this morning, Steve Laddick, on C-SPAN's Washington Journal. By the way, it goes without saying um, that you really have to read Lawfare blog. You have to read Just Security, uh, both, uh, because it is where the best uh, debates are being carried out. And in fact, uh, Bobby referenced the seven uh, War Powers Resolutions letters. They're available at Lawfare blog via link. Uh, they start with June 16th uh, of this year, and they end with September 1st. Um, okay, Steve Vladek, uh, what do these two gentlemen have wrong? I know they're your friends. Um, uh, you um, uh, made, a, I think, a, a fairly forceful argument this morning uh, that uh, the president certainly had some inherent uh, Article II powers with regard to this, but you said there are a lot of other open questions, and you were really arguing for uh, a robust debate in Congress in small, at least small part because you were worried that um, relying on the 2001 AUMF, and if I'm putting words in your mouth, correct me, um, could set a bad precedent. No, I think that's right. And, and, and so let me, let me sort of start there because I think at the end of the day, I probably don't disagree that much with Steve or Bobby, but it's worth underscoring how many assumptions um, we, are, we are making <clears throat> to get there. Um, and so for me, part of the problem is that this legal debate, which is fascinating, and we're lawyers, so we love legal debates, um, has actually drowned out and jumped over a couple of fairly important predicate questions that really no one seems interested in talking about outside of this room, at least. And you know, Steve went a bit in this direction. Um, and there are two that I think are really missing from the conversation. The first is, what exactly is the nature of the threat? Um, and why are existing authorities inadequate? Um, you know, Bobby spoke quite, I think, uh, uh, persuasively about Article II authorities, the president's ability to act in self-defense, at least with regard to some of what we're talking about. You know, I, I think whenever we talk about declarations of war, and Cully talked about the five that Congress has passed, or even more limited use of force authorizations, almost all of them come with some real sense shared by Congress and the president that existing authorities are insufficient. Um, and it's not clear to me that that conversation has been had or that case has been made. <laughs> Steve says it's obvious to him um, that the threat is like the threat that al-Qaeda posed before and in the weeks and months heading up to 9-11. Um, that's great. It's not obvious to me. Um, and part of why it's not obvious to me is because I'm an outsider. I haven't been in the government. I haven't worked inside the intelligence community. And so I think part of the problem is that we're jumping into a legal authority question, assuming the answer to the, are we sure we have to do this question? The answer may be, well be yes, I don't have a, a, a dog in that fight. I just feel like that's a conversation we have to have first. Um, and instead, everyone's sort of falling over themselves to come up with the best legal theory that explains how we can do what we apparently have decided to already do. Um, this is also why I think I would part company a little bit with Stephen, suggesting that we're not going to talk that much about international law. Part of why we have moved away historically from declaring war is because one of the mo real developments in international law after World War II was the movement to outlaw aggression and aggressive war, was the movement to constrain permissive uses of force by nation states to uses of force in self-defense. Um, now, we can fight about whether collective self-defense is a viable theory, whether the unwilling and unable test that we've heard the Obama administration, indeed President Obama himself, offer yesterday before the General Assembly is a viable reading of international law. But that's part of why we don't just authorize force willy-nilly. We authorize it in very careful circumstances where we have a very concrete sense of what the end game is. So that's the first sort of set of predicate questions. What is the threat and why do we need a statute for it? The second set of predicate questions, you know, Steve referred to military action. Bobby talked about airstrikes. I think it's worth stressing that the legal authorities may well differ based upon the exact kind of force we're using, where we're using it, what we're doing, and against whom. So historically, I think there has been a very bright line between scattershot airstrikes, one-off attacks um, that are clearly uses of military force, and sustained campaigns leading up to and potentially even including ground troops. Right? Historically, we have tolerated presidential uses of force without congressional authorization, um, the more limited those uses of force are, the, the less widespread they are. And so part of the other problem is that we are assuming um, different facts about what kind of force we are using and about what kind of force we will be using, when to me this is actually very much still an open question. 
um, just how extensive is the U.S. military commitment going to become, how widespread is it going to become, and that will drive the question of what legal authorities President Obama will or will not need. And so it strikes me that we've jumped over those two questions to, is it legal? And the problem is I'm not sure what it is. Um, and so I think part of why it was so problematic that Congress went home after 12 legislative days after the summer recess, which you know we should all be so lucky, um, is that Congress never had this debate. Instead, we saw a series of competing proposals, one from Congressman Wolf that would have authorized the use of force against all extremist Muslim ideologies everywhere, um, one from Senator Kane that I think was far more carefully circumscribed, um, but all of which were assuming that there must be some kind of forward-looking authorization without, I think, a real national consensus on what the threat is or why existing authorities are inadequate. So at the very least, it seems to me that we have to start there. Um, and that only then can we really effectively and meaningfully assess the legal questions that we're here to debate today. That said, um, since we're lawyers, let's you know get to the legal questions. So assuming that there is threat of the, along the lines Steve has described, um, problems and, and sort of uh, um, facts along the lines Bobby has described, what about the 2001 AUMF? Um, and I just have to, I have to needle my friend Bobby a bit, because shortly after his post where he couldn't come up with a, a plausible explanation for how the 2001 AUMF could justify the use of force, I wrote a post that said, here you go. Um, I'm not sure I'm right, but I guess I was plausible. Is that the, the bottom line? Remind me what you argued. Um, <laughs> so the argument was that you could treat ISIS as a successor of al-Qaeda, that ISIS was <laughs> al-Qaeda for purposes of the 2001 AUMF and not an associated force. Right. And, and I, just to pick that thread up, the title of my original post had sort of gestured at how we've been talking about associated forces, and I kind of mockingly said, now it's successor forces. Right. So I don't think the successor argument, that the ideological successor argument works, because then it could be Boko Haram tomorrow or Ansar al-Sharia the next well, so, day. Well, so this is where I'm going. And so, and so this is why I think Steve is right that the 2001 AUMF does authorize at least what we've been doing thus far. Um, on this theory that is plausible, if not convincing, right? Um, but it shouldn't. I mean, I want to be really clear on this. It really shouldn't. Um, and the reason why it shouldn't is because I don't think there's any question that Congress back on September 14, 2001, was thinking of anything like this, was thinking that 13 years from now, we'd be dealing with a successor group of al-Qaeda in countries far away from Afghanistan and Pakistan. The reason why the AUMF doesn't actually specify al-Qaeda and the Taliban is because President Bush had not yet publicly declared that those were the groups that attacked us on 9-11. When the AUMF was passed, it was still six days before President Bush would give his national TV address where he said, yes, we are convinced it was al-Qaeda and the Taliban. So the statute is actually unfortunately open-ended. Now, what that means is that a president who is looking for authorities on which to rest uses of force, lest he provoke a constitutional crisis, is going to look to statutes that are unfortunately open-ended. That doesn't mean we should be happy about that. It doesn't mean we should champion that. It doesn't mean we should think that that's a good way to do business. And the reason why it's not a good way to do business is because, indeed, as Bobby just said, what stops the president from saying it's Boko Haram tomorrow, the Irish Republican Army on uh, Saturday, and on Monday, the ACLU? Um, now, of course, the answer is politics, right? The answer is politics will stop him. Um, but that's not enough for me, and that shouldn't be enough for us, right? The problem is the statute needs to be clearer because the American people have to have more of a buy-in into what we're doing. And this is, I think, a, a, a structural flaw in the AUMF. Steve mentioned that the AUMF is unusual in the history of use of force statutes. Part of why it's unusual is because we didn't know who attacked us at the time we passed the statute. Part of why it's unusual is because it has no end game. Right? The AUMF is still on the books because it had no sunset. It had no geographic scope. It had no substantive goals, the accomplishment of which might actually cease the authority. And so I think it's actually problematic to suggest that we can rely on this statute, or even worse, that we should enact a new statute that suffers from the same problems to deal with the threat that's still evolving on the ground. So that brings me to Congress, and I want to say a, a word about Congress, a word about the courts, and then you know, hopefully the, I, I've provoked my friends into yelling at me. Um, so what about Congress? And I think this is where this debate is entirely maddening, um, because this is not actually a typical dispute over the war powers. Typical disputes over the war powers historically are where the president wants to do something and Congress basically says no. Um, a good example of that is the airstrikes in Kosovo in 1999, when the House actually had a vote on formally rejecting the president's authority to con conduct the airstrikes. Um, you may remember the House tied 
I think it was, what, 216 to 216, um, on whether there should be a formal rejection of the authority. That's the usual constitutional fight for war powers. Here, we don't have that fight. Here, we have Congress saying, oh, we completely support use of force against ISIS, but you know what? You go do it. We're going home to run for election. Um, that's not the way this is supposed to work. And so I think part of the problem, you know, folks are inclined to blame President Obama for what I think is really abdication of constitutional authority by Congress. Um, and so I think it's important for us to keep in mind, not just that it's better for Congress to enact a specific statute, but that it's actually Congress's constitutional responsibility. Are we really going to hold it against the president when one branch isn't doing their job? So this brings me to my last point. So if you actually believe um, that the 2001 AUMF, by saying that we are uh, allowed to use military force against anyone the president determines is responsible for 9-11, really is a broad delegation of authority to the president, then the question is, who's going to stop him? And Bobby referred to the uh, Guantanamo detainee litigation as a good example of the role courts can play in circumscribing the war powers. Now, it's certainly true in the habeas litigation that in none of those cases has a court said, government, stop this military operation, right? Stop the bombing. Don't attack this target. But the courts have said, it is our job, at least where habeas is concerned, to decide whether you are properly subject to the use of military force. Part of why we haven't had law yet at the <coughs> margins of the AUMF is because both the Bush and Obama administrations, to their credit, have not really tested the margins at Guantanamo. Um, none of the detainees have been detained on the ground that they're a member of an associated force of al-Qaeda as opposed to al-Qaeda or the Taliban itself. None of them have been detained on the ground that they were substantially supporting al-Qaeda or the Taliban as opposed to directly participating and being a member of those organizations. So we haven't had cases to flesh out these margins, not because the courts can't handle them, but because they haven't arisen. And this leads me to my last point. In his uh, majority opinion in 2008 in Boumediene versus Bush, this was the big Guantanamo habeas case, Justice Kennedy spends some time at the end of the opinion, noting how it's been a happy uh, accident of history that the courts have basically been able to stay out of war powers disputes. Um, it's a charitable reading of history that they've been lucky to stay out. They usually had to invent some clever ways to stay out, but leaving that aside. But then he says, <clears throat> as the nature of conflicts change, um, and as our structure evolves, that may no longer be possible. Um, now, of course, it's typical Justice Kennedy. No one has any idea what he meant, including Justice Kennedy. Um, but I think you know, he was getting to something which I think we're going to see more of going forward, which is in the Guantanamo detainee cases and in any other context in which there's a way to get a justiciable dispute into the courts, whether it's a US citizen who's a member of ISIS, who's a subject of one of these strikes, um, or whether we conduct more detainees, uh, detentions under the, under the AUMF, I think we're going to see more and more pressure on the courts if Congress is not going to exercise its constitutional responsibility, if Congress is not going to play any role in checking the president, even in plausible, if not obvious, readings of statutes. We're going to see more pressure on the courts to take these cases. Um, I suspect that the four people sitting up here have widely different views on whether that's a good thing or not. I actually think it is. Um, but I, the, the bottom line for me is I think it will be an increasingly inevitable thing. Before I ask Steve to take on his namesake, uh, quick. Yes, my parents named me after Steve Bradbury. Well, oh, that's, that's nice of them. Um, uh, quick lightning round yes or no answers. Uh, Will Congress take up a debate about an AUMF after the election? Yes, no. Yes. 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 All right. And I, I think, I think uh, you all get an A for that. That's, that's <laughs> correct. I think that's correct. But, can I say, but the debate's going to look very different depending on, on whether the Republicans take over the Senate or not. Hmm, interesting. Um, Steve. Um, you know, there always has to be a reasonable basis in fact to determine that uh, the organization you're targeting is an organization that falls within the uh, 2001 AUMF. Uh, but the AUMF and the court cases <coughs> and the National Defense Authorization Act in 2012 that uh, affirmed the AUMF's detention authority and, uh, and continued to underscore that Congress agreed that there was detention authority there. They don't use the term core, al-Qaeda. Um, and there are, I grant you, difficult questions uh, at the margins about what is al-Qaeda, what is a, an associated force. And I, I think we can 
all agree that it, there would not be a reasonable basis to say the Irish Republican Army falls within the AUMF, and uh, that would not be sustainable. And there may be cases such as the courts have addressed that are uh, difficult cases at the margins, like the case in the Parhat, the Parhat case involving the East, I think it is, the East Turkmenistan Islamic Movement, which was, I believe as the court understood it, a local insurgent movement in Turkmenistan that embraced the uh, um, the uh, embraced the thinking of Al Qaeda as inspiration, basically. And you you can argue, well, is that sufficiently associated with Al Qaeda, and and that may present a uh, a difficult case. My point here is we've got a lot of, if you will, genetic material in ISIS that comes from Al Qaeda sufficient to say this sprang from al-Qaeda and is al-Qaeda. My point is it's not an associated force. It is al-Qaeda. Uh, Al-Qaeda launched al-Qaeda in Iraq. And al-Qaeda in Iraq, as I think Bobby suggested, launched al-Nusra, uh, <clears throat> provided the venture cap, if you will. Um, and al-Nusra, we would say, is al-Qaeda. We call it an al-Qaeda affiliate in uh, in Syria, and the Khorasan group is really just a particular faction or subpart of al-Nusra. Um, so they're all springing one from another, and uh, it 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 can't be that just because ISIS is so successful at what it's trying to achieve that therefore, because now it has an independent profile and uh, a center of strength that is clearly viewed from Zawahiri's perspective as part of the old core al-Qaeda as a threat to his leadership. Uh, it's out of his control. Uh, but just because they're so successful at their strategic goals and achieving those goals that somehow we then lose the authority to continue the war on terror against them when they've sprung so clearly from uh, the base of uh, of Al Qaeda, and I think it's the reason the 9/11 uh, AUMF <coughs> isn't limited by geography, <coughs> isn't limited by time, is because it was true, and it continues to be true that the war on terror is a global conflict without borders, and it is a long-term conflict that the U.S. is in. It, it's not over. We didn't win. We haven't defeated Al Qaeda. The old quote core Al Qaeda is diminished in its capabilities, but Al Qaeda's organization lives on, and its current reconstituted form, ISIS, is more virulent, more potent, and a bigger threat than ever. So, I mean, I, I just want to be clear. My position, my view, is that at least based on the uses of force that we've been discussing to date, there is a plausible argument that the AUMF, that the 2001 AUMF, does cover ISIS. What I was trying to suggest was that we shouldn't like that argument, right? That, that that's because the AUMF is poorly drafted. Um, and so, and let me just to stress why. Um, so Steve says there's a lot of genetic material in ISIS, and just because they broke away doesn't mean that they should be kept separate, they should be treated as a separate entity. Well, we broke away from another country once. Um, I don't think anyone would have argued that because the U.S. broke away from England and had all of England's genetic material, we were therefore at war with everyone England was at war with circa 1787, um, or even 1776, I guess, depending on what you were talking about. Right? That there has to be something more specific. And if there was a statute that authorized war against England or all of her heirs in perpetuity, I think we would have serious policy qualms about such a statute, even if it was fairly read as covering that scenario. But if we did continue the war, which ISIS has continued the war, that's the point. They're still engaged in the conflict against us, whether we like it or not. But, but I guess, I mean, the question is, what, what support is there for that besides two beheadings of Americans? I mean, right, there have been no attacks by ISIS on American soil. There have been no attacks by ISIS against U.S. bases or U.S. embassies, right? So when you say they're still at war with us, I mean, I'm willing to accept that premise. I'm just not sure it has yet been proven. Let me join Bobby, in. Jump, jump in. Yeah, I just and, and if you could pick up, uh, if, if you're able to, on, on some of the... Um, the points that Matt, uh, Matt Olson made uh, well, you that, know, on, on, in this regard. I, you know, so I, I wasn't sure I was going to say anything because Steve kind of 
got that in there. Steve uh, Vladek okay. got that in there just now by pointing out that there's there's a real question out there as to what the intentions, capabilities of ISIS are vis-a-vis -vis the United States. It's tricky because there's a tendency in the public debate to define it in sort of a binary. Right. Have, have they actually attacked us? If so, then we're in sort of the, it's the hostilities against us, national security, uh, national self-defense posture. And if they haven't, then never mind them. I actually think it's more complicated than that. I think that deep down, the, the reason why ISIS uh, already, even before its big surge in Iraq, um, to borrow a phrase, uh, before that success put it on the front burner for the administration, it was already on the front burner simply because whether or not it was adopting a str strategic commitment to external operations, which is what that game's all about, um, it was certainly in a position and was becoming a safe haven from which others would be able to do so. And over time, it doesn't take a rock rocket scientist to see that the existence of ISIS um, as a territorial unit sooner or later could provide uh, the type of cover that Afghanistan once provided to al-Qaeda. And that's a, a deep strategic threat. It's just harder to articulate because it, it's obviously much more speculative. You have to estimate that over time it would either itself adopt an external operation strategy, which it hasn't yet done, or that it would allow others within its territories to do so. I think it's a safe bet, but I can see why the administration has not to this date said that's the real motivation for what we're doing. But I think that's a big part of their motivation. Well, I think they did say that's why they targeted the Khorasan group. Oh, for Khorasan, yes. I'm, I'm I talking I'm ISIS saying, only. Well, I'm saying They're not the Khorasan same. is a faction of al-Nusra, which was launched by ISIS, and ISIS is giving them safe haven to operate and plot. No, that's, not, that's not accurate. ISIS and, and al-Nusra occupy distinct territories, and they fight with one another. Al, the Khorasan group is an, an al-Qaeda cell that is harbored by the al-Nusra indigenous fighters, but it operates and answers, and in, in, it's got no connection to ISIS at all. It, they're, they're two very distinct entities. And I just want to say, I mean, I, I, as I said, I'm willing to be convinced, right, that there's a factual record that would support the notion that by providing a safe haven to different kinds of multinational terrorist groups, that ISIS is thereby dramatically increasing the danger to the United States of a terrorist attack. The problem is, is, that, it's, it, is that that has to be the predicate. Um, because otherwise, I mean, Steve keeps saying war on terror. We are not in a war on terrorism. We are in a war against specific groups. And the predicate for that use of force, the predicate that Congress relied upon in, in the AUMF, was some tie to 9-11. And so it can't just be bad terrorist group that wants to do bad things to the West. It has to be terrorist groups that either are directly connected to al-Qaeda or that are involved in imminent plans for ongoing attacks against U.S. personnel and U.S. homeland. Would, would you all agree with the general proposition that I made in my ISIS AUMF paper that was published yesterday and available out front and on heritage.org um, with this, that the Congress, uh, should the administration choose to, to provide them with this uh, information, uh, will have classified information uh, of a, the specific nature of the threat and the lineage between core al-Qaeda and these other uh, uh, branches of the route, uh, uh, and that that uh, should play a large part in the debate going forward. You know, this goes to S Steve Vladek's uh, opening arguments. You, you were saying that we really haven't had enough debate about the non-legal policy predicate for, for who these, what ISIS really is and what kind of threat it poses, and you suggested that we uh, were putting the cart before the horse a bit with the legal arguments. It, it seems clear to me that that's not the case because the administration has committed us and, and is, has committed itself to taking not just an episodic approach to this. Uh, there, was a, there was a DOD presser the other day in which the Joint, Ch Joint Chiefs uh, Director of Operations, uh, Lieutenant General Mayfield, explicitly said when asked by a reporter, you know, is it this air campaign, are, are we talking years, multiple years? Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, mm -hmm. we're talking years. It's, it's a multi-year air com commitment. Um, other documents explain that it's not just an air commitment. It is a, it is a boots on the ground commitment. But when you hear boots on the ground used in these debates, it's being used in a particular way. The administration's clear commitment is no trigger pulling by people who are Americans on the ground. No trigger pulling. But there will be lots of and are lots of American soldiers, special ops, and otherwise uh, on the ground providing higher headquarters command and control coordination capacities at least at the, the battalion level and that's something that's been talked about a lot in the more detailed Pentagon press briefings and that's a long-term commitment that is widely understood to be the only way that the Iraqi military is going to be able to recapture territory in its own 
uh, own land. This is a substantial commitment, and the administration has already decided to do that. So it's it's past time to have the legal discussion that goes with it. I think there there will be a debate tomorrow in the British Parliament, yeah. in all likelihood. And the uh, uh, opposition leader Ed Miliband has already said he will support. Uh, British participation in the war effort, at least in Iraq, um, based on the understanding that ISIS does pose a threat to Britain and to Europe by virtue of all of the British and European nationals who have flocked to fight there and the concern that they may well uh, be returning uh, soon to conduct attacks uh, in Europe and in Britain. And the British government has identified uh, an attack that killed four uh, people at the Jewish Museum in Brussels as an ISIS uh, attack. And so uh, at least the British government seems to have intelligence information sufficient to reach a conclusion in Parliament, likely tomorrow, uh, that ISIS does pose uh, the threat of terrorist action against, uh, against British interests including in Europe. But I have to say, though, I mean, again, and, and, and maybe I wasn't clear enough the first time around, the point is not that there's no threat posed by ISIS. The, 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 the point is how much of a threat is there and what kind of force are we talking about? And so Bobby says the military is already planning for years. Well, that's fine. Congress hasn't. Um, right? There, we haven't had a conversation about the appropriations for all of this use of force overseas. And so it seems to me that you know, it's one thing to say ISIS today poses a threat that requires some uses of force. The notion that it is now settled um, because of military planning, that ISIS poses a threat that's going to require an enormous investment of U.S. military and financial resources for years, despite the fact that Congress has said nothing on the subject, strikes me as very much putting the cart before the horse and as a conversation that really is going to happen, whether we like it or not, after the midterms. I took you to be saying that as a, as a public, we weren't having the conversation, the administration wasn't having the conversation. If you mean simply that Congress isn't doing it, Completely agree. Congress doesn't want to do it because they don't want to be accountable for how it might turn out. <laughs> but I don't, th I don't think the public's having the conversation either. I think the public is too busy watching video of beheadings to talk about whether that really means we need, you know, billions of dollars and, you know, tons of thousands of, of troops on the ground. Well, I'm sure most of the public is watching this event live streamed <laughs> right now, so they'll be better informed. Let's uh, turn to the audience, uh, if I could. Uh, I would ask you uh, the courtesy of two things. Please give us your real name. Um, and ask a real question, uh, and I'll uh, exercise the prerogative of cutting you off if you speechify. So I'll start with the gentleman in the glasses in the second row. Hi, my name is Paul Mirangoff. Uh, I'd like to ask uh, S Steve Bradbury, whose argument was, was very good, whether though it's giving enough um, taking seriously what ISIS actually says. I mean, Obama doesn't take them, what they say seriously. He says they're not Islamic and they're not a state. But are, are you taking it seriously enough when you dismiss them as just rebranding uh, Al-Qaeda and you dismiss Al-Qaeda as just bitter? Aren't there really real ideological disputes between those two organizations, one of which goes right to the core question of how dangerous the United States might, how much of a dangerous post to the United States in as much as I, as I understand it, ISIS is, has kind of want to focus on a region, just kind of socialism in one country, so to speak, whereas um, Al Qaeda has been much more fixated on attacking the U.S. Well, I, from my understanding, and I don't have access to all the intelligence uh, gathering and intelligence information, right? But my understanding is it's a, it's a disagreement, if it is one, over the means to the end and the speed uh, with which you uh, pursue those means in terms of uh, declaring a caliphate and establishing a territory. They've already taken territory and declared a, a government structure that's multinational. And I think they clearly don't want to end just where they are. They have the same long-term goals in terms of running out of Saudi Arabia, and the Middle East governments that are friendly to the U.S., running the U.S. and Western powers out as influences, running Israel into the, into the sea. Um, so the, the goals are the same, and I don't think they've forsworn terrorism. I mean, they, they, they've beheaded Americans. That's, that is a very acute form of terrorism, 
practically as effective as the attacks of 9-11 in terms of the terrorist impact uh, on the psyche of uh, Western populations that, that something like that would have. And they've, they've said they're going to target Americans, French, British, everywhere they find them. And uh, they've got fighters with U.S. passports and British passports and European passports that are loaded guns ready to come back at any time. So why, you know, I, I, think, I think it's pretty clear it's very consistent with the vision of Al Qaeda and the and the tactics of Al Qaeda, but there's a, clearly a disagreement over who's in charge and what they want to emphasize first in terms of uh, the means for carrying for carrying that out. Anyone like to briefly weigh in on that? I think that's exactly right. All right, here in the front, and then we'll, okay, you were first. Yes, go ahead. Uh, yes, sir. My question is that who would benefit more? Uh, from this attack, Republican Party or Democrat Party. And other part of the Khrasan uh, movement, I met General Gull, he used to head ISI. By chance, I met him in Lahore Ambassador Hotel a couple of months, few months ago. And I asked him the same question because there was a, in Pakistan, liberal <coughs> part of the media was criticizing government that Nawaz Sharif government got $1.5 billion from Saudi Arabia and it's sending, uh, sending all troublemakers to Syria, the name Khrasan. So I asked this question to General uh, Gull. He told me, have we in American uh, overcome the problem of drug use in the state? I said, no. He said, why? I said, because demand is there. So he said, it's the same problem. As long as demand is there, you call them troublemaker, you call them terrorist, you call them you know, Islamist, whatever, they would be there. Thanks. So, I, I won't venture any political prognostications on it. I'll just comment that there is. You know, the, the comment about the, the degree of demand, or in this case, we might say the, the, the attraction that um, <clears throat> situations like the combat against the Assad regime, before that, you know, Afghanistan, before that, coming to fight Americans in Iraq, there's obviously uh, ample evidence that these scenarios do lead to large numbers of young men who want to travel to go get in these situations for a host of reasons. And there's a spectrum of radicalization involved. Some people are just joyriding, in effect, and others are planning to kill as many people as they possibly can. And there's a whole terrible spectrum in between. Um, it, it points out, though, that there really is, um, there are a couple of moving parts in thinking about who is it or what is the nature of the threat. The threat at bottom is, is that entire milieu mm -hmm. But we have, at least up to this point, resisted defining the, the scope of the armed conflict we're engaging in as coextensive with all that. And we've, we've focused on al-Qaeda as the particular most dangerous manifestation of it. There, there are many groups, and it's not just al-Qaeda and ISIS. There are other groups. Um, you know, Boko Haram is separate. They've declared that they're now a caliphate because now people have realized, oh, you get attention for that. So we're now a caliphate, too, and our guy's in charge. And, and, and uh, in Libya, there are multiple groups that... Um, have, you know, some groups that previously had pledged allegiance to al-Qaeda have uh, lost members who said, now we're following uh, al-Baghdadi. He's our caliph, not Mullah Omar through Zawahiri. You have, you have a bunch of, an array of contenders. And so the, the stakes in the legal discussion, it's almost a proxy for just trying to come to grips with who are the entities, wh when is it virulent enough and dangerous enough to, to warrant an overt military response? As an interesting aside, I think I recall from open source materials that the head of ISIS al-Baghdadi we actually had in custody in Iraq for a period of time. We did indeed. Yeah. I think, uh, to be fair, it was you and then you, and then I'm seeing a hand over here, in front here. Thank you. I'm uh, Will Embry uh, from DynCorp International, but formerly the State Department. I realize that I came to a discussion on the legal issues here, but we got an awful lot of late lawyers at the front desk here. Uh, and having worked with the various administration lawyers, you, you can stretch the legal argument in a lot of different directions. And, and I accept the argument that you all have made saying, uh, yeah, the, you know, the 2001 AUMF is probably <coughs> sufficient. But this is really a political issue. And I just wondered if, if you could think about the, the political, not the partisan political, but the, the political needs of the administration and the American people to have a new AUMF that more specifically deals with issue, this issue, even though, as you said, you need to leave it pretty open-ended because the war is probably not going to be over for a while. I think from what I heard from all of you, you all would agree that as a political matter, it's probably a good idea for there to be a debate on this and even perhaps a, an AUMF. This is something we haven't mentioned, but I think maybe is one reason why it seems so why, as Steve said, why haven't they just done it? Why hasn't Congress stepped up? Why haven't others done it? 
Um, there are many possible reasons. One possible reason is it, it's tricky from the administration's perspective, given its desire and commitment that it has stated to wind down, to, to shrink, tailor, and then ultimately repeal the 2001 AMF, to go into Congress and open up the topic of the AMF. As I've heard it sort of whispered to me in back channels for many years now, there's a general reluctance to do that on the principle that, well, who knows what Congress is going to actually right. end up giving right. them. The White House has clearly committed to just say they want to repeal or, or narrow the 2001 AMF, but they're going to go ahead and just write it out rather than giving Congress more occasion to potentially pass something like what you described, the, the, the war on all extremists. Right. Well, and the other thing is, and I think the White House is still smarting from the Syria experience yeah, last summer. Yeah. And so, so you know, I think, I said before rather rather flipply that, that I think much depends on what happens in the Senate. But I actually think there's a, there, here there's a specific tie, which is that if the Democrats somehow hold on to the Senate, I actually could see, you know, President Obama coming out in full-throated support of Senator Kane's proposal mm -hmm. um, and getting that through the Senate and then putting the pressure on the House to say, listen, we've got a proposal. The President's on board, the Senate's on board you know, stop dragging your feet. Um, but I think that the politics of that change dramatically if the Democrats are actually complete lame ducks in control of the Senate. And it's going to be much harder for Kane's proposal to get through. So, you know, I, I think the reality is it's better for small p politics if Congress and the president reach some kind of, you know, deal on the AUMF. But the big p politics are going to get in the way, um, especially if the Republicans retake the Senate. Comment? No? Okay. Uh, the lady here in the front. Wait for the microphone, please. Sure. Thank you. My name is Tara McKelvey. I work for the BBC, and I'm wondering if you can tell me why they chose, why they came up with a name, you know, Karasan, why they did it. Is there some legal reason that they came up with a name? And then what are the, some of the effects of having a name like that? Does that add to their credibility of the group? Does that give them more power? Well, I can't claim to know the particulars of who precisely decided what. I certainly don't think it has anything to do with legal considerations. My understanding is that Khorasan is, is an old term in, in Salafist circles. That would refer to the Afghanistan-Pakistan region of Central Asia back in the days of the actual caliphate. And the idea was simply to describe this subset of um, the, the apparent small number of members of the Khorasan group, um, <coughs> according to what's publicly reported, are mostly Yemenis and Saudis, um, they were all people who had been um, with the senior leadership in Pakistan um, and had bit by bit been returned out to go to Syria as a new and, and better safe haven. Um, the idea of calling them the Khorasan group is this is a group that either was self-identifying that way as to distinguish themselves from al-Nusra and the others who were there to focus on Assad in Syria. That was never their focus. They are there as a safe haven from which to work on external operations. But that's just based on what I've been reading in the papers, so I don't have any special knowledge about this. But I definitely don't think it's meant to have any legal significance. I think it was an, uh, an intelligence analysis term of art, most likely. Over here. Uh, Robert Moore. Um, it seemed that, that part of the reason why a, a few of you couldn't quite say yes or no if we needed an AUMF for ISIS uh, is because of either the, the broadness or the ambiguity or just the inherent flaws in the 2001 AUMF. And I think you may have discussed this a little with two questions beforehand, but should the conversation then be, instead of maybe looking at a separate ISIS AUMF reform of the 2001 AUMF to, you know, with 13 years of combat in, in hindsight and legal decisions in hindsight to better fit what the perceived threats of now and the future are going to be? So I mean, I'll just take I'll I'll take this. In, in an ideal world, yes. I mean, I think um, my colleague Jen Daskal and I wrote a paper last year uh, or earlier this year titled "After the AUMF," that was basically looking in this direction even before ISIS became such a a, a prevalent threat. Um, I I do think it would be it would behoove us, especially given everything we will have learned from this conversation. I don't just mean this conversation. I mean the national conversation. Um, that if Congress is somehow going to put its heads together and come up with a new AUMF, that in the process. Um, it either scale back or get rid of the 2002 Iraq AUMF, which if we're not using it here, we'll never need it for anything else ever. Um, and the 2001 AUMF, um, which to my mind is already, you know, outdated in its scope, you know. And so that would focus on which groups today still pose the kind of threat that justified that statute 13 years ago. Um, Bobby and I, I think, have slightly different views about how best to, to design that statute. But certainly, I think it would be better than just leaving this open-ended, amorphous statute on the books that says nothing about the specific groups. Do you want to plug your yeah, Hoover Task Force paper? Well, yeah. I mean, so 
Gold, Jack Goldsmith, Ben Wittes, and Matt Waxman and I took a shot at just sketching a possible statutory framework for extra AMF threats, um, a Hoover Institution paper that was meant to spark conversation, which it duly did. And we've, we've had lots of disagreements about the particulars, but, you know, the underlying, it's, it's like Steve Vladek just said, the underlying idea that it, it's as simply a matter of good government to, to update and freshen, refreshen the articulation of who it is we're fighting in light of where we are in 2014. Um, in theory, that's the right way to go. I think one thing we see from the, the lack of political will, even in circumstances where everyone seems to more or less want to support the same outcome, um, it convinces me more than ever that maybe there just isn't a lot of interest on the Hill and in the White House in collaborating on these kind of good government changes to the statutory authority. And why should you win Article Two authority? As long as what you want to do is always going to be air power and not boots on the ground pulling triggers and certainly not detention no matter what. If that's what you're going to do, then I don't even know why you need the AUMF other than the politics and the political cover you might get from it, because there's nothing you can do with, there's nothing there you can't do with the Article II authority if you really feel like there's a national security threat. Steve, can I ask the flip, or a, a little version of that question? What is the danger um, <clears throat> that you would see in uh, repealing the 2001 AUMF with some newer, prettier, shinier modified AUMF? Well, let's, let me repeat. I think it's a good idea as a policy matter for the branches, to, the political branches to come together and have the debate and to frame a new AUMF going forward. So I, I do support that as a, as a, as I think good government and a good idea for the nation and, uh, and will put us on firmer ground and with greater clarity. But the potential danger in simply repealing the AUMF is a false sense or a false declaration that the war on terror is over, uh, that the, the war that we realized we were in after 9-11, but in fact the, the enemy had declared sometime before that, uh, is really not over. It's continuing, and I think that's a major point I'm, I'm trying to make. And, of course, we had an administration that has – tried to project the view that it's winding down and it's it's not an indefinite war and it can end and and we're working toward declaring it over unfortunately the facts have gotten out in front of that and in indeed it is it is continuing and so if you enact something new that's in fact more artificially narrow and tries to be very carefully incremental uh, there's a real risk that it would uh, hamstring the executive branch and the president too much in in the ability to respond effectively as the threat changes and morphs um, on the ground. Uh, and I think the president, in that likelihood, in that eventuality, would likely act first and then come back to get uh, authorization tinkered, tweaked, expanded. Congress, and I don't think that's a good situation to be in. In other words, it would be nice if the authorization is, in fact, in advance uh, and covers what we all understand is going to be happening. It's very difficult to do in precise terms on a on an incremental, you know, sort of organization by organization basis. Be before uh, we take the last two questions, my last lightning round question <laughs> for you three: um, <clears throat> Yes or no? And if you don't want to answer it that way, you're lawyers. You know how to get around it. Um, uh, will uh, the United States uh, pick up or ultimately detain ISIS fighters? You can start. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, by detain, I assume you mean capture. Um, and what happens after capture, I think, is very much in the air. And I don't know that there's going to be any stomach for any kind of Guantanamo II. I think, I think we will inevitably capture at least some ISIS fighters, and I think those that don't get immediately turned back over to some kind of local authorities will end up in Article III courts here mm -hmm. in the United States. I don't think we're going to do detention operations if by that we mean we are administering them on the model of pre Camp Boko, Camp Cropper, Bagram. Instead, uh, this would only be in Iraq. The Iraqis will do it, and we will have access to them. And we won't want anything more than access to them. Mm -hmm. Steve, do you have a sense? No. Um, all right. I, I think I promised uh, this gentleman and then there. So here in the front. 
Fred Bonig, I'm a Gold Star dad. I have three more kids currently serving. And uh, my question is for Steve on the end. Um, the connection between Al Qaeda and uh, ISIS, you know, is pretty much established that you all kind of have the same belief. But uh, last month we lost five uh, people in Afghanistan, um, three uh, non combatant, but we did lose a general. This month we've already lost two soldiers and a civilian. Um, who are we fighting in? in Afghanistan if it's not Al-Qaeda there, if it's not all the same enemy? So I'm not sure I ever said it wasn't Al-Qaeda. Um, but I mean, I think, I think there's still heavy Taliban presence in Afghanistan, and I think there are still some elements of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. You know, I, I, don't think, I don't think when we pull combat troops out of Afghanistan, perhaps as soon as this December, but certainly by 2016, that means that that will signal that we have eradicated Taliban and Al-Qaeda <coughs> influences from Afghanistan. I think it'll just mean that we have accomplished the goal, which was to sufficiently degrade them such that it can no longer provide the kind of safe haven for Al Qaeda that it provided in the months and years up to 9/11. So, you know, I, I don't. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying that 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 all is well in Afghanistan. I don't think I ever said that. I think it's just that the nature of the threat has evolved, where there's still a threat, but it's a very different one from what we saw 13 years ago. But what you said was um, that you know the only person that they've actually killed, that ISIS to make it a threat to us, um, was the journalist. When in reality, if it's Al Qaeda, then they're killing people. So that's, okay, that's not what I said. What I said was the only Americans that ISIS as such has attacked are the two Americans, who, journalists, who were beheaded. I didn't say anything about Al-Qaeda not attacking Americans. It's pretty clear that there's still every effort by what Al-Qaeda groups remain to attack Americans wherever they can find them. I just don't think that that fact by itself justifies a perpetual war. I think it goes without saying that we all um, uh, send our condolences to your loss He's a Gold Star family member. Um, we all know people in the service. I've served. Um, uh, anyone else want to tackle that portion of the question? Just, I'll just, well, I do, actually, there's something I can't resist saying about it. We're, you know, obviously, we've, the, the administration is committed to pulling combat forces out of Afghanistan, but we shouldn't imagine that that means we're not going to be involved in Afghanistan. What are we going to be doing? It's going to be what we're doing in Iraq. And they'll have their hands full with the resurgent Taliban in 2015 and beyond, doing exactly the same sort of things we're doing in Iraq right now, dealing with the resurgent ISIS. Yeah, and and it, last numbers I heard, the administration plans to leave about 9,800 uh, forces there, and NATO, um, 3,500 or so as well. Uh, last question in the back. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ahmad Bitar. Actually, I'm from Syria. I just arrived a couple of months ago. I was lucky to see, you know, uh, the perspectives from the Mr. Eastern people and here in the U.S. by attending those events. Uh, before this American intervention against uh, ISIS, ISIS was hated by other groups. They were fighting. Uh, the reason they were fighting with Al Qaeda, I can't explain it, but actually, it's too, it would be too long. It's about victorious group and some very religious things. I know that because of my background. But my question is. Uh, if, um, I'm seeing what it has been written on Facebook and in social media from Syrians and from Middle Eastern. I think uh, American intervention helped ISIS to be like more supported by the others because now, instead of you know a bunch of Islamic groups fighting together, there is like uh, an Islamic attack by infidels, which is like Western countries. So, and sir, what is your question? My question is: Is there like I'm 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 uh, I'm watching this legal explanation, which is are amazing, but is there is any attempts to explain that to people in the Middle East? Because not doing this will create another enemy, which is like those uh, uh, illiterate people who will be you know influenced by uh, ISIS propaganda that they are being targeted by you know those countries. So, is there another any kind of uh, explanation for this or attempts to do this? Well, uh, we would look first to the President of the United States to give that explanation and answer for the U.S. And I think the President Obama tried to do that yesterday in his speech at the U.N. So I think in his mind he was attempting to explain uh, the reasons, the objectives, and to address some of the concerns that, uh, that uh, you raise. If, if the concern that attacking an enemy that we view as posing a threat to our interests and the interests of allies will stimulate more opposition f 
from like-minded people, and therefore we shouldn't do it, well then that is a, a reason for taking no action at all and uh, would have the effect of handing the territory taken, handing the victory to, to, to the group. So obviously that's a policy decision that's, uh, that is in the hands, first and foremost, of the President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense. So um, I'm sure they've weighed those uh, considerations carefully. But it has been the consistent policy of the United States, at least since 9-11, that the best defense for U.S. national interests and the interests of allies and other countries that we support and support us, the best defense in this war on terror is a strong offense. And uh, I think the current president, at least to a good degree now, has come around to that, uh, to that view as well. Any concluding thoughts from any of the panel members on any of the topics we talked about uh, today? Please join me in thanking this panel. We stand adjourned.